Okay, it is 9 a.m. Good morning. I'd like to call the December 15, 2020 City Council meeting to order. Please call the roll. Dave Warren? Here. Soldier? Here. Bagwell? Here. Garza? Here. Fire State Cavala? Here. Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And Paul Brown will be giving this morning's prayer. Thank you. Would you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, sometimes we, uh, we don't know the words to say. With all this gloom and doom, uh, hasn't been a lot of positive news. But Lord, during this time, we can celebrate the birth of the Savior. And Lord, we thank you for Jesus. Lord, be with the governing body. It's not an easy task. They seek to do what's best for all. So please, continue to guide them. And Lord, pray that our people would not let their guard down against this virus. Lord, we pray for our health care workers. Protect them and guide them. Give them strength and bless them. For they have an unequal burden. Lord, we pray for our educators as they try to continue to educate the children. Very difficult environment. Lord, we just thank you that we can come to you with our needs. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. 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 Next item, please. <clears throat> item four, oral communications from the audience. Okay, this is the part of the meeting where we allow comments from those watching online um, on items that are not on the agenda. I understand we do have at least one person who would like to make some comments. If you could state your name whether or not you are a resident of Hutchinson and limit your comments to five minutes. My name is Anthony Frischenmeyer. I live at 511 East Avenue C. And today I'm, I'm joining you as a representative from the Prairie Independent Living Resource Center and as a disability advocate. Um, as I was doing my job recently, which is to help people with disabilities find employment, I came across the job posting for the human relations officer position. Now this position is the position in the city that is there to help mediate discrimination, yet we're using discriminatory wording on the actual job posting. Um, in the job posting, it is said that um, under the environmental and conditions and physical demands, the language that was used was that they must be, let me, get the quote right, um, ba basically able to vision to read printed materials, a computer screen, hearing and speech to communicate in person and before groups over the phone. This language is the same language that was used to discriminate against my uncle and my grandmother who had visual impairments when they wanted to use and gain gainful employment in the community. It's this language that has been used and kept my uncle from being able to get that, that employment. In 50 plus years that he was alive, he was allowed to work 17 of those 50 years because of language that like this. I personally know multiple people across the state that are qualified individuals who would not even apply for this job because of this language. Now the, the response given to us by the city manager is that this is a bona fide occupational qualification and are needed to perform the essential functions of this job. This to me is a slap in the face and is a slap in the face to every person with a disability. Under the ADA that was passed 30 years ago, we got our civil rights and this should have taken care of discriminatory language like this. We are asking today that you take this language off. It, it, it's just as simple as to say that you are an equal opportunity employer. This language is not on any other city job listing, not one. We, you know, in the, it, okay, I get it that it, it's, this is legal language. It, it's legal language that protects cities and employers, but in the United States and in Kansas, in Reno County right now, there are employers that are able to get a certificate under the um, 
what is it, the basically it, you can get a certificate that makes it right for you to pay people su- with disabilities subminimum wage for the exact same work that you must pay somebody without a disability minimum wage. Does that make that right? No, it doesn't. It, it, it's something that needs to change. These are the languages that has been used to discriminate against people with disabilities for far too long. 30 years ago when the ADA was, was passed, these words were said, let the shameful walls of exclusion come tumbling down. And yet we're still using language that is used to discriminate against us 30 years later. So we just ask that this language be removed from this position as it is not on any other job position in the city. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony. Um, I had a few questions. Um, one, I don't know if the city attorney could explain the framework behind the um, essential functions and, and what kind of restrictions we can put or qualifications we can put on certain positions. And two, is this the only position we require um, to have that ability, or is it the only one listed? Quite frankly, I haven't reviewed that job description, so I won't comment on that. Okay. Mayor, let me jump in just real quick. Okay. Uh, we did have some communication. Uh, through the HRO, and I know additional information was put out to the board members. I'm not sure if Anthony got all that information or not, but uh, Tom did indicate that when the initial posting went out, there were some items that uh, could be uh, opened up on that, and accommodation could be considered. Uh, So I don't think any of us are in disagreement with what he just said. I think he got information late or maybe still hasn't received the information, uh, would be my guess. So... The HR department is aware of that and did make some changes. Somehow when it went out, uh, it was explained to me that the input uh, item on the computer propagated and launched its own information and it got sent off uh, in error, but that has been corrected. Now, I will say there are still um, some requirements for any position that we would put out that uh, would have to be um, considered for accommodation, something that we would have to look at individually. So if somebody did want to apply, this is not exclusionary. It does not say that they can't apply. It just means that we would have to consider those accommodations and whether or not they would be reasonable accommodations for that position. So, okay. So this but the language itself is discriminant. It will keep people from applying strictly on the language used. All that we have to put is equal opportunity employer. That's it. Let me get back with the governing body on that because I, I do think that some of the changes that HR made may have addressed some of this, unless Anthony's looking at a live posting still right in front of him right now. So you feel like this particular posting has already been remedied? I'm going to verify that, but my understanding is that we have made some modifications to it in response to concerns that the commission brought to us. Uh, I don't believe that it will ever uh, resolve all the concerns of the commission, but I think it's probably been reviewed and uh, thoroughly okay. considered. Well, thanks yeah. for your responsiveness to that. And Anthony, we really appreciate you bringing that to the city's attention and for your constant advocacy for people with disabilities. Um, continue to, to keep us on our toes and hold us accountable. I, I sure will, thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else on the line who would like to make a comment on items not on the agenda? No? Okay, I think we're good to go. So, um, hearing none, next item, please. Item five, consent agenda. Any thoughts on the consent agenda? I'll move to approve the consent agenda as printed. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Hearing none, please call the roll. Dave Line? Yes. Yes. Bagwell? Yes. Garza? Yes. Carlos Yes. Next item, please. Item 6A, consider resolution for gap waiver for fiscal year 2020. Good morning, Council. Angela Richard, Director of Finance. Um, The state of Kansas statutes and the Kansas Board of Accountancy require that we file our financial statements in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles, otherwise known as GAAP. Unless we opt to um, adhere to the Kansas regulatory basis of accounting. Um, In prior years, we have waived GAAP 
and decided to follow the Kansas regulatory basis of a county. I've listed on the memo some of the key highlights of the differences between GAP and um, KMAG, which KMAG is the Kansas regulatory basis of a county. Um, the staff's opinion has been that it would be a higher cost to prepare GAP financial statements and would be more time consuming and that the general user of our financial statements would find KMAG um, easier to understand. So staff recommends um, passing the resolution to waive requirements of KSA 75-1120A. Are there any questions? Is there any um, limit to like, do, that we need to convert to GAP at some point or is it just one or the other? It, there has been no indication from mm -hmm. any regulatory authority that we would be required to report under GAP. Mm -hmm. um, it used to be common for bond requirements to require GAP, but those bonds do not require GAP any mm -hmm. longer. Uh, we used to provide financial <coughs> statements under GAP for the water, sewer, stormwater fund as part of their bond requirements, but we no longer have that requirement. So. I don't foresee, at least in the near future, any requirement to follow GAP. Okay. Well, I would move to approve resolution declaring that the requirements of KSA 75-1120A, parentheses A, are not relevant to the preparation of financial statements and reports and waiving the requirement of conformity with said act in favor of conformity with the cash <laughs> basis and budget laws of the state of Kansas and authorize the mayor to sign. I second that. Okay, is there further discussion? Hearing none, please call the roll. Dave Wine? Yes. Soldner? Yes. Bagwell? Yes. <coughs> yes. <coughs> yes, next item please. Item 6B, consider resolution appropriating funds to pay payrolls and claims for 2021. Angela Richard, Director of Finance. Um, the next item before you is another annual uh, resolution mm -hmm. that we do. Um, it has been staff's understanding that every year we adopt a budget and we have to uh, limit our expenditures within that budget. So it controls our spending. We also have purchasing policies, internal controls, and other monthly reports um, to oversee our expenditures and you also are provided with the detailed list of expenditures with every council packet so it's been our understanding that we have controls to oversee expenditures and payroll and so we have passed this resolution every year allowing us to pay claims to pay invoices and to pay employees their bi-weekly payroll in advance of you seeing those expenditures it is staff's recommendation that we uh, continue this practice and adopt the resolution as submitted. Any questions? Motion to approve res resolution providing for the appropriation by fund of the budget of the city of Hutchinson for the year beginning January 1st, 2021 and appropriating money from the various funds to pay payrolls and claims against the city of Hutchinson for the calendar year of 2021 and authorize the mayor to sign. Second. Okay, we have an emotion, a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, please call the roll. Dave Wine? Yes. Solner? Yes. Bagwell? Yes. <coughs> yes. Cyrus de Carvalho? Yes. Next item, please. Item 6C, consider resolution approving 2021 refuse rates. Okay. Angela Richard, Director of Finance. Um, the city is in a contract with Stutzman's Refuse um, or Waste Connections through 2029, and our agreement with them specifies that annually the rates will increase 2%. Um, so before you is a list of the items and the cost of the uh, trash and recycle, the current charges and what they would be with the 2% increase. Um, so a residential service would go from 950 to 969 and the commercial from 1025 to 1049. 
Um, but the additional recycled carts are not subject to that, so their price will stay the same as well as the additional fees, which are noted below, um, like the additional pickups that they have. Um, so the staff's recommendation, recommendation is to adopt <coughs> a resolution for the refuge rates as presented. So they go up every year 2%? Yes, but what happened was when we signed the uh, contract with Stutzman's to renew it and extend it, mm -hmm. they lowered our rates significantly. So it'll take us until 2029 or just about mm -hmm, to get mm -hmm. back to where the, um, the price was before we extended the contract. Okay. So um, it ended up benefiting the citizens. Okay. Can you tell me when we lowered them? When do we? 2020 was the first year that it lowered. Uh, 2019 was the year that we re-signed the contract and extended mm -hmm. it. 2020 was the year that the rates fell. I'm sorry, I honestly don't remember what the rates were before in 2019. Yeah. I don't have that yeah. noted, but it it was like 10 something. So it, it dropped over a dollar <coughs> and now it'll take till 2029 ish to get back to where the rates were. So do we do this again in another two years? Yes. Yeah. Actually next year. Yeah, next, next year. year. We'll yeah. do it every year. One year. Yeah. <coughs> it's a time. Well, I would move to approve resolution establishing rates and charges and franchise fees for collection and disposal of garbage and trash by the city, all as authorized by sections 10-209 and 10-210 of the Hutchinson City Code and authorize the mayor to sign. Second. I second that. Okay. <coughs> okay, is there any other discussion? Hearing none, please call the roll. Dave Lyon? Yes. Soldner? Yes. Bagwell? Yes. Garza? Yes. <coughs> yes. yes, next item, please. Item 7A, consider approval of bids for CDBG housing rehabilitation projects. Good morning, members of council and mayor. Uh, Ryan Beatle, director of planning and development with the city of Hutchinson. Uh, some exciting news this morning. Uh, we are finally moving forward with uh, bids on the first three homes for our CDBG um, housing rehabilitation grant uh, in the Creekside area. These are for properties at 618 North Adams as well as 108 and 124 West 7th. Just as a kind of a quick reminder, uh, in January of this year, the city was awarded uh, $256,500 from Kansas uh, Department of Commerce for housing re rehabilitation projects and improvements um, in an area uh, between West 6th and um, West 8th and between Maine and Adams. Um, SCED is our grant administrator and we actually have Bill Lampy um, on Zoom uh, here this morning to uh, answer any questions you all may have, but uh, this is a process of where um, SCAD worked with uh, um, different contractors. They did a walkthrough of these homes and uh, drew up a list, and you can actually see that in the bid. These are, um, as you see, it's going to be mostly things like roofing. Um, one of the big things actually in all these homes is uh, replacing all the wood windows with the new double hung vinyl uh, windows, which will be a huge savings for these uh, property owners. Um, installing new guttering, um, paint, that, that type of thing, uh, replacing siding. Um, so really kind of more um, major things for the homes. So these will really extend the life of these homes. And so um, we got some pretty good bids actually. Um, so we did request, um, put a uh, call for bids out and we received bids from three different companies, DH Home Improvements here in Hutchinson, uh, New Windows for America, and Arambola Construction, both out of Wichita. And uh, staff is recommending that uh, uh, DH Home Improvement would receive the bids for 618 North Adams and 108 West 7th, and that New Windows uh, of America would receive the bid for 124 West 7th. And I'm happy to answer your questions y'all may have. Ryan, uh, are these owner occupied? Yes, these are all, all owner occupied. Okay, mm -hmm. very good. <coughs> And if I remember correctly, these are both companies that we have dealt with in prior years on yes. this project. Yes, we have, yeah. and um, and these contractors came very high, uh, highly recommended from SCAD, um, yeah. as they are familiar with CDBG projects, not only in Hutchinson, but in other communities, as well as their weatherization. So yeah. um, we believe that they would be able to um, get the work done quickly and on time and on target and all of that. So uh, we think that this is a, an excellent thing. 
the intent would be that while we are working on uh, these first three homes, we would go out for our second round of bids so we could continue that work uh, mm -hmm. moving mm -hmm. so we could get through this grant very quickly. So we're very excited about mm -hmm. this. This is a, a big, uh, there's been a lot of work on this grant. It's, it's an exciting day to actually get to bids, so. And Ryan, we have enough funds to do approximately 10 homes. Is that what we're? That's what we think. But um, as you can see, like I said, we, we budgeted about $25,000 for each home. And, you know, we've got some that have come mm -hmm. under. So hopefully we can do, you know, maybe more than 10. But, yeah, the intent was to do about 10 homes. And are we only considering those who did pre-applications? Or, I mean, the application period for this grant is closed. Uh, no, it's, no. It's, it's rolling. It's, it's rolling. Okay. Um, so uh, we, we will be working with SCED uh, to go out and continue to solicit those applications. So. And John had asked if they were, these particular ones were owner occupied. Are rentals eligible for this with a certain? Rentals are eligible. Um, they require a 25% uh, uh, matching mm -hmm. okay. um, for it. So um, we <coughs> do have one that we're working on that is a rental, but it does have some uh, lead paint in it. And so we're having to go through that process, including the blood test and all of that to see if there's if there's an issue and if there is then we'll have to determine if uh, the lead you know if, if it makes sense for us to do that project okay. because it could get pretty expensive to do lead abatement great and those interested in maybe applying would contact you or sked directly contact us and uh, okay. we'll work with them and sked to to get the the information that they need okay fantastic is there boundaries to this yes uh-huh the, the 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 target area is between uh west sixth and west eighth um, in between, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, and then uh, between Maine and Adams. Mm -hmm. Maine and Adams. Okay. And we'll be able to apply for a different area of town, and this is like a two year cycle, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So maybe okay. the end of 2021? <coughs> yeah, so our intent would be we will probably uh, go out for um, another CDBG in 22. Okay, so. great. Okay. Well, thanks Good. for Who your makes the on. boundaries up? Um, we worked with, uh, we did pre-applications, um, and we worked um, with uh, SCED to kind of map those out and see where um, it would make sense, uh, where we gave the most bang for our buck. Because um, the, the state really, it used to be you could do a much larger area, and they really kind of are now trying to do much smaller areas because you can get a lot more impact um, instead of having homes that are just kind of scattered out throughout a neighborhood. So we try to do about a four block area. And if I remember correctly, we did have two different areas of town competing for the mm -hmm. ability to yep. get this. Yeah, we, we uh, were initially looking at Creekside and then Southwest Bricktown, um, and um, we kind of put the power in the neighborhood's hands to, you know, go out and be advocates in their neighborhood and, and see if we could get property owners that were interested. And, uh, yeah, the Creekside area um, definitely came through with more, um, with more uh, pre-applications and then we went and looked at both of them and it just made more sense to do Creekside. So, um, yeah, we'll certainly um, definitely be going out again in, in 22 um, is our intent to apply again. So, Fantastic. Well, Ryan, this is great. Thank you so much. You're welcome. These, uh, these grants from the federal government, I know they come with a lot of strings <laughs> and, and they're not the easiest to administer. So, no, Absolutely. And, and thank you to Sked and, and um, Bill, I don't know if you're on the line, if you have anything you want to add. No, actually, uh, we're just, uh, we're actually a little bit ahead of schedule. We're already inspecting for the second round. Um, we feel like there actually is an outside shot that you might even be able to to write um, in August, which would actually put you a, a year ahead of schedule. Of course, that would uh, depend on applications and, and obviously um, in our current environment that we could, you know, get in and, and move forward. But um, we're really encouraged by the, the number of people uh, wanting to participate. So uh, the partnership with Hutchison has just been incredible and, and how many people have, you know, really wanted to participate has been incredible. So it's, it's moving along uh, quite well. Okay. Well, that's exciting. Thank you so much, Bill. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Bill. Yes. I will move to approve two bids from D&H Home Improvement 
for 618 North Adams in the amount of $24,850 and 108 West 7th in the amount of $21,200 and a bid from New Windows of America for 124 West 7th in the amount of $17,750. Second. <coughs> second. Okay, motion and a second. Any other discussion? Hearing none, please call the roll. Dave Lyon? Yes. Soldier? Yes. Bagwell? Yes. Garza? Yes. Harris and Cavallo? Yes. Next item, please. Item 7B, consider Cal Creek and Southwest Bricktown Park concrete, headwall, and retaining wall repair project. Good morning, Council. Jessica Lowe, Assistant City Engineer. A portion of Cow Creek travels through downtown Hutchinson via a series of open channels and below grade culverts. At Southwest Bricktown Park near West First Avenue and North Jefferson Street, Cow Creek goes underground into a concrete box culvert. As is typical with box culverts, retaining walls are positioned on each side of the culvert opening to protect both the culvert and the adjacent slopes from eroding into the creek. The head wall on the top of the culvert also retains some soil and protects pedestrians and vehicles from getting too close to or from going over the edge of the box. At this location, the head wall and retaining walls have separated from the box and are at risk to fall into the creek. Well, that's not good. No. <laughs> Don't Without the wall's protection, the retained earth can also erode into the creek, disrupting flow in the creek and creating a safety issue for pedestrians and motorists who may be on top of or around the box. Show you pictures as well. This project will remove the failed culvert head wall and retaining walls, and a new head wall and retaining walls will be placed. On Tuesday, December 8th, the city opened bids for the Cow Creek and Southwest Bricktown Park concrete head wall and retaining walls repair project. Three bids were received. The low bid was from Ward Davis Builder and was below the engineer's estimate. This project will be funded through the Stormwater Maintenance Reserve Fund. It is recommended that City Council accept the low alternate bid of $87,397.30 and authorize the mayor to sign the contract with Ward Davis Builders. Does anyone have any questions? Why is the alternate bid actually cheaper when the estimate has it more expensive? Yeah, we actually were surprised by that and we contacted the contractor and talked to him mm -hmm. and even he was kind of surprised where the numbers came back. Yeah. But he contacted three suppliers of that particular block, and that's uh -huh. just where the prices are right now. Okay. Just making sure nothing got missed in the yeah. communication. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we talked to him, and I actually yeah. talked to our design engineer as well, and yeah. everyone's confident. I think we just got lucky. Um, you know, right now, with the colder winter months, contractors mm -hmm. are looking for work to fill their, you know, their schedule until spring construction happens. And okay. then again, with the, the price of the blocks, we just got a good price on that, so. Okay. I should know what this means, but under the bid alternate one, MBW, $47,052 line, and what is that? Modular block wall. Oh, okay, uh, that's the materials. Okay, yeah. thank you. <laughs> Very good. Well, yeah, Ward Davis has done a lot of great work for the yep. city, so I think we, we did indeed just get lucky and I'm not mad about it. Yeah. Merry Christmas, nope. Ward. Okay, is there a motion on this item or further questions? <coughs> Action, the motion to approve the alternate bid from Ward Davis Building in the amount of $87,397.30 subject to all legal requirements and authorize the mayor to sign. I second that. Okay, there's a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, please call the roll. Dave Lyon? Yes. Soldier? Yes. Bagwell? Yes. Garza? Yes. Carlos de Carvalho? Yes. Thank you, Jessica. Next item, please. Item 7C, consider golf course master plan improvements. What do you think, John? This one's really not worth it. Yeah, we should, we should just kind of go on past this one. Justin, you have the floor. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, Justin Combs, Director of Parks and Facilities. Um, this should be exciting already. All right. um, so this item is for the bid results uh, for Phase 5 of our golf course master plan improvements. Uh, just high level um, of the improvements. Um, really kind of the primary goal of the improvements that we've been making is to replace 
uh, the ductile iron uh, main irrigation lines. Lines that were install installed most likely in the 60s, possibly as early as the 50s, um, as well as all of the PVC lateral lines and all the heads, irrigation heads that would have been s installed in 1981. Um, that's kind of the primary purpose of the improvements. But additionally, along the way, as we do the irrigation improvements, we're also making kind of playability changes and, in, and improvements to the golf course. Um, this phase um, will improve four holes. Um, we'll go through those um, one by one. Um, another thing I want to point out, and it's hard to read on, on the screen here, but I'll point it out. Um, uh, right here we, we have kind of a diagram of how the distances of each hole has changed. Um, on three of the four holes we're improving, um, actually um, we have a longer tee. Um, and then the three of the four holes that we're improving, we actually have a shorter tee. Um, the intent there is to try to accommodate players of all ages and all skill levels. Um, so we're providing a shorter tee um, for players who need that. Um, we're also providing a further tee, um, provide challenge um, more for our college type kids um, who are really hitting the ball really hard. Um, so we'll kind of go through these. This is hole five. Um, hole five gets uh, all new tees. Um, we will use the existing green. Um, one of the highlights here is this kind of the center bunker. Or, or two bunkers that kind of choke down the, the fairway um, on, on hole five. Um, hole six here um, is our short par three. Um, all new tees. Uh, or excuse me, one new tee. Um, we're going to use the existing green. The existing green is in, in fairly good condition. This is the new tee um, here. It kind of creates this, this nice little shot over this bunker. I um, also want to point out um, right now, this is a pond. Um, sometimes it's a swamp, sometimes it's a pond. Um, and so alternate one in this um, is to fill this pond in and create this really large um, kind of waste bunker. Um, th this will fill with water, so as the uh, water table um, comes up, because we're so close to the river, um, this will fill with water. Uh, but then in the drier season, um, the water table goes down and this will be a large bunker. Um, the intent here is to get rid of this really eyesore um, of a pond here. It gets really smelly, it gets very stagnant. We don't have a way to put fresh water into it. Uh, we looked at lining it, trying to make it in a real pond. Um, this really was kind of the best solution we felt like. Um, it it kind of creates that same hazard um, to, the, to the player, but does it in a way that's a little bit easier to maintain. It'll be um, definitely a better looking um, feature to the golf course. Um, hole seven here, um, it's a brand new green um, and all new tees on um, hole number seven. Um, this is one we are making longer and shorter. Um, again, trying to accommodate some of our uh, players who are maybe aren't hitting <coughs> the ball as far as they used to. Um, we have this new forward tee uh, that should, be, um, should help some of those other players. Uh, and then hole eight. Um, hole eight gets an all new green um, as well as new tees um, as well. Again, this is another one um, that's getting a little bit longer um, and as well as shorter um, to accommodate some of those other players. Uh, and then our practice area, so this is alternate two um, in our bid, uh, our practice area. Uh, this is an addition to our, our existing practice area. Um, this is the current driving range, the edge of the driving range here. Um, so really what we're proposing is a new green as well as some chipping areas um, and a new bunker um, here. Um, and then this space here then does provide um, another area for people to hit out into our range. Um, Part of the reason this is so important to us um, is we are home to uh, three high school uh, golf teams. So Bueller, um, Hutch High, and uh, Central Christian all use our course as their home. Uh, so they practice out there nearly every day um, and then have multiple events out there. Uh, we also are home to HCC and Sterling College. Um, so during those times of year when we have all those student athletes out there, um, they really, um, cause a lot of um, congestion to our practice facilities, whether it's our putting greens or our driving range. This provides another location for that practice to happen. 
um, not just for our student athletes, but really for, for anyone. Um, just kind of relieves the stress that, it, that is put on uh, during some of those peak times. Uh, here at the bid results, um, pretty drastic. We had two, uh, Hauska and Mid-America Golf and Landscape. Um, our estimate based on previous years um, for this was 400,000. Um, so Hauska is, uh, is under what we anticipated. They also are low, low bid. Um, we've had the previous two phases were done with Hauska. They did a fantastic job. So we're very, um, very confident in their ability uh, to do this work. Um, I think you know, sometimes you always wonder when you get one that's so much lower. I think on this case, house goes really where they need to be in mid-America was just really high. Um, but again, we are confident in house go. So, um, with that, um, I do recommend we proceed with house go um, for phase five for amount not to exceed uh, $364,118. Um, and I do want to mention, as I uh, pointed out in the memo, this is one of two bids for this phase. Uh, the second bid will be um, for the actual sod for the grass that goes along with this with this phase. So this is just for the all the irrigation improvements, as well as to all the, the dirt and earthwork that goes with the improvements. How many more phases do we have, Justin? <laughs> Two more phases. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Two more phases. Um, just so wondered. the next phase will be 10, 11, 12, and then 15, 16, and will be our last phase. Okay. Time to start over with the phase one. I, I know. <laughs> yeah. Let me so, make a comment or two, if I may. Yeah, absolutely. Um, went back in time a little bit, and my recollection um, goes back really into the early 2000s, where a gentleman by the name of Densmore Hart, some of you may remember Densmore, mm -hmm. uh, through his leadership, uh, brought to the uh, forefront uh, to the uh, city council at that time really the need to put some attention on Cary Park because it had been years and years and years and years since anything really sub substantial had been done to the park. But at that time, the challenge uh, in 2002, 2003 of the city council was is that there was no provisions in the capital improvements program to fund the beginning of uh, the master plan. And it took about six years before the cycle, uh, the process worked through the, uh, the budgetary process to where the first phase of the master plan was uh, implemented. And in my judgment, the initial priority, and, and Justin's done a good job of outlining uh, basically the, the bones of, of the project, but it's particularly been the irrigation system uh, that I think is the core to me of this master plan. And all the other amenities I think are wonderful and have made great improvements, but the infrastructure Namely, the irrigation system is the most critical part of, of uh, this, this phase project. So it's taken uh, 17, 18 years to get to this point. And um, I, I think our ultimate goal is to complete what we began and what we started back in 2003. And uh, this is phase five. So I, I hope uh, we'll get favorable consideration in support of uh, this phase five. Oh, yeah. Justin, I had no idea that many schools used this <laughs> course as their home course. Yeah. Do you have a, like MOUs with all of them, or how does that work? Um, I believe Tyler has, and Matt can maybe help me with this one. I believe Ty Tyler does have agreements with, with the school. Um, I think they get discounted rates on things, uh, but they do bring a lot of energy um, to the golf course. It's great seeing them out there. Um, you know, and another thing, not just with the high school kids, but also we've, or Tyler, I guess I don't want to take any credit for this, uh, has really put an emphasis on our junior golf program. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this year was pretty slow <coughs> with everything that happened, but uh, from 2015 to 2019, we've doubled the amount of, of youth. Um, so those are um, 18, 18 and under that have been um, enrolling in our specific programs. Um, so we've gone from 30, 35 or 36 kids to 2019, that's 76 kids uh, oh, participants wow. that en are enrolled in some of these programs. Because um, we do see that you know the general population of golf is, is aging, and so we're doing what we can to kind of kind of cultivate that n that those next generation of players, whether they're high school, college kids now, or even younger. Oh, that's great. Okay, so What's the current um, for the golf course? How much does it? Is it bringing any? 
So yeah, the revenue or what are the expenses for renting? So the on golf on the operating there? side, um, we are on track for 2020. Um, so through the end of November, to be at a 75% uh, cost recovery rate. Um, that is up 10% from 2016, 2017. Um, so that's been a goal of ours every year to try to increase our revenue and, and really keep an eye on costs. So cost. that's a 25% loss then at the current rate, is that Correct. what you're saying? Yep. Okay. What does that equate to as far as? Um, depending on the year, um, between 200 dollars and $250,000 is what that transfer from the general fund is. And how much is this project going to cost as far as bond payments for the, for the year? Um, I don't know about the annual bond payment. Um, component of it, but I can tell you what the, um, the overall cost of the improvements over the last 15 years um, of the master plan is, if that's... Well, I mean, what increase in cost is this going to increase on the cost for the bond? Like, is it going to, is there the current phase is expiring and then this one is picking up, or are we going to have another bond with an increased cost, lowering our cost recovery? That's what I'm asking. Um, I think Angela's got something to yeah, say. Yeah, so, so all of the all the funds up to through this phase have all been in, in, um, uh, approved in the budget. So some of this mm -hmm. funding is in the 2020, yeah. uh, tw some of it's in the 2021. Right. So all of those bond payments um, through 2021 have all been calculated and should be in, in the approved budget. So I, to give you the specific number of what those are. Well, I guess what I I'm know wanting to know is, you know, what's the return on investment? for taxpayers that are contributing to the plan? Um, like, yeah. is it just gonna decrease our cost recovery because we're adding $364,000? Is there a way, um, is the base bid, is that, like how much is covering just um, getting the um, water lines and stuff? Just the irrigation? Just um, the irrigation. Matt, you have the, the breakdown. Hundred and seventy-nine thousand um, is the irrigation piece of this, and that's what's absolutely needed. Correct. I think it's important to remember that I think the utilization rate for uh, twenty uh, nineteen was twenty-five thousand people used our golf course mm -hmm. for the general public, um, and. I think we need to look at it as part of our overall parks and recreation system. And that's really what the golf course is part of. It's part of an integral park system at Cary Park where 25,000 people enjoy the, uh, the golf course. And uh, to me, that's a great return on investment as a service and, a, and as an amenity to what the, are the taxpayers of Hutchinson. What are our costs compared to the private golf courses? Like how much cheaper are ours? Like if we're subsidizing <laughs> we this with- don't wanna know. If, if we're subsidizing this with taxpayer dollars, then we're making it more affordable. Is it cheaper to golf at our golf course versus a private golf course? Yes. Way Considerably. Yeah, it, yeah it can, uh, comparing to a private mm -hmm. uh, golf course, yes. Uh, we do every few years, actually every year we evaluate what our fees are mm -hmm. um, and try to make them in line with other uh, municipal golf courses. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I can tell you that municipal golf courses do range in the amount that they subsidize. So, um, you know, being where we're at, we are definitely not out of line for other communities on how they support their their municipal golf course. I just get concerned when we're constantly subsidizing. Like we can't subsidize on everything. I mean, if we lose 250,000 a year on the golf course, 700,000 a year on the zoo, and all of these other things, you know, these are future payments from future generations that have to pay for these things. So I just need to make sure that we're thinking about those return on investment since it's future generations that are paying for it. 
I will offer that a business case can't really be made in this instance. And I do recall from prior coursework, and this is going to date me a little bit, it does go back about 15 years at least, that a 40 to 45 percent cost recovery on golf courses, mm -hmm. public courses, is fairly typical in the region. And that's not a great number. Nobody would enter into that kind of uh, business model uh, with the interest of making money. But uh, much like a public swimming pool or other public amenity, it's entered into with the mindset that it would have to be subsidized. Um, yeah. It gets pretty philosophical, I'm sure. Yeah, it's a quality oh, yeah, of I'm life sure. it is. issue. <clears throat> but if we put pressure on Justin to return it <clears throat> with a profit any given year, uh, he's going to surely disappoint us uh, when he comes back to report that, uh, <laughs> alas, it has not produced a profit. I'm just interested on how much more of a cost is it going to cost. Does that make sense? It does. How much is it going to reduce our cost recovery? That was my main question. I think it's, well, yeah, Angela, you might be able to speak to this, not to put you on the spot, but we've balanced those phases out pretty <coughs> well mm -hmm. um, so Correct. that we're not injecting Correct. an enormous Cor Correct. burden. Yeah, we have um, so every year, um, um, beginning, I want to say 2015, we have budgeted annually in the CIP project, uh, in the CIP for master plan improvements. Um, and then the goal is to every two or three years actually complete a phase. Uh, so we're bonding or, or budgeting for a piece of it. Part of it's um, to reduce disruption to the golf course. We don't want to be tearing the golf course up every year. Um, and part of it's just to keep uh, this item in front of council. So every year through the CIP discussions, we're, we're talking about this, keeping it out in front. Uh, um, so that when it does come time to do the phases, we've, we've kind of thoroughly flushed out um, everything in the budget process. So, yeah. I, I just wanted to reassure you that I did budget $500,000 for this phase to mm -hmm. be bonded in 2020. So those bond payments are budgeted for 2021. Mm -hmm. um, so that is in there. It, it has been accounted for. It's hard to say exactly like what our payments would be per year because it depends on what other projects we're bonding it with. Because we have, uh, if we can bond all the projects together, we have a lower cost of bonding. Mm -hmm. So it's gonna lower your payments. It also depends on whether we pay it over 10, 15 or 20 years. Um, Cause we look at that every time we bond so that we um, can balance our debt loan. And we have debt policies that say that 50% of our bond um, debt has to be paid off in 10 years, the next 10 years. So we're constantly trying to balance that. Um, so I know that's not a very helpful answer, but it, it all depends on what else is going on and how we spread those debt payments out. Thank you, Angela. Further questions for city staff or comments? I would move to approve the contract with Hushka Incorporated for phase five of the golf course master plan improvements for an amount not to exceed $364,118. I will second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Further discussion? Hearing none, please call the roll. Jay Blank? Yes. Soldner? Yes. Bagwell? No. Garza? Yes. Carlos de Carvalho? Yes. Next item, please. Item 7D. 2020 financial analysis. He's working on getting the PowerPoint up. Okay. Um, so Angela Richard, Director of Finance. Um, I had been asked by council to provide a financial analysis to look at trends and where I thought we would end the general fund cash balance at. Um, so that is what I have provided today. Um, I wanted to remind you of what has gone on in 2020 and what steps we have taken. Early 2020, uh, we were told by some reliable sources that we needed to prepare for revenue to decrease in approximately what we saw in the 2008 to 2009 recession. And then we needed to double that and be prepared for that. It may realistically be the same as that recession, but to prepare for twice that impact. So that's what we looked at and that's what we prepared for. We prepared to see a 1.1 
$1.65 million decrease in sales tax. And to compensate for that, um, council and the former city manager um, and uh, myself and the HR director, we all came up with $968,000 worth of expenses that we could cut from the 2020 budget to offset that impact. So that is what we implemented. But what we found was that sales tax did not align with what we had predicted. Um, here's a graph of what has happened between 2017 and 2020 with sales tax. The orange line is the 2020. So you can see how our sales tax has compared to prior years. Um, you'll see in February, the uh, blue line uh, was a blip there. That's an unusual amount that was collected from a compensating use from a large uh, manufacturer in the area. Mm -hmm. area. Um, so that was unusual. And then in the green, which is 2019, in September, you see a blip there that it went higher as well. And that was from the jail sales tax that expired at the county. So since June, that orange line has remained higher than the 2019 green line, except for that unusual month with the jail sales tax. Um, so um, also I wanted to note that compensating use tax year to date has been higher by 21% compared to 2019. But the, comp um, but the normal sales tax has remained pretty steady. So we've just seen a, tr a complete shift in trends. Hmm. Mm -hmm. um, how long it'll continue probably remains to be seen. Um, I have some theories about what's going on, but, um, but that's what we've been seeing so far this year. Um, revenues that have been impacted negatively are the transient guest tax, that's the hotel tax. Of course, we mm -hmm. didn't have um, the NJCAA tournament and travel has been down. Um, the special alcohol tax has been down because bars were closed. Um, the state highway tax has been down as travel has been down. Mm -hmm. These three revenue items are ones that could continue into 2021. It really depends on COVID, <coughs> um, quite frankly. frankly. Um, so I wanted to point those out. So using the trends we have seen and using the trends we have seen um, for expenditures in prior years and how departments like to spend their money in December, using all those trends, I've tried to project where our general fund ending cash balance will be at the end of the year. And right now, um, solely based on those trends, I can see us having about $6.6 .6 in cash at year end. Because we didn't see the decrease in revenue as drastically as, as mm -hmm. we thought we would. But we did implement those cost saving strategies. So, um, that's good. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and our policy so, is about 5.1. 5 5.2 5 ish. Yeah. 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 Somewhere in there. It depends on, um, well, it, that could have gone down since our spending went down. True. So I'd have to reevaluate that, but um, I did provide projections of revenue and then um, projections of what our expenses may look like for the year. So um, do you have any questions or? Um, Angela, I'd just like to compliment uh, you all, your department, uh, our management staff uh, for uh, being very prudent and uh, very conscientious about managing this challenging budget for 2020. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think we all should uh, appreciate uh, that we've got great fiscal management at, at our city level and in our, in our finance department. So thank you very much for your good work. Yes, we, we couldn't have done it without Jeff's help and yes. uh, Tom in HR as well. Is there any cost savings that we could, as far as, the couldn't we take out personnel weight raises? Are we able to give some of those back now that we didn't get hit as hard? I think we kept that item as contingent as um, open, salary increases open in negotiations. Yeah, that's yeah. actually been negotiated. Yeah. And based on these numbers, uh, there's no indication that we would be relaxing um, 
th those compensation strategies, uh, everything appears to be whole. And, and I do concur. Uh, you're kind of waiting. All right, what's going to happen? Is fourth quarter going to fall off? Has everyone already spent mm -hmm. their fund money? What's going on? Yeah. Uh, because these trend lines really don't comport with some of the initial uh, concerns that not just we had here regionally, but across the nation in some areas. So, uh, yeah, we're still on the hook for those for sure. Okay. And by the way, much appreciated too in some of the other benefit areas where the governing body stood tall in uh, mm -hmm. rewarding the employees. So thank you for mm -hmm. that. I've heard all sorts of words of appreciation. Thank you. Did you include the um, raises in the projection for the end of January? Um, no, this just covers the end of 2020. Okay. Um, so any raises for 21 aren't a factor, but it, the raises that are already in place in 2020 are carried out through payroll mm -hmm. through the remainder oh, okay. of the year. Okay. So. Um, okay. I guess that makes sense. Very good. What's your recommendation, Jeff, as far as maintaining some of the cuts that we were forced? It's uh, the process that we have in place now is one where uh, when I came on, um, the policy was very clear and appropriate for the time and the modeling of the period. But uh, what we're continuing to do is to review asset purchases that would ordinarily fall under discretion of the, the okay. departments. And so we're still looking at those and we're still holding a process for that. Uh, some of those we've deferred. We've uh, gone from new equipment to used. Uh, we've gone to uh, repairing equipment and putting investments in high time equipment that you might not ordinarily do based on minimal and infrequent use of that equipment where it makes sense. Mm -hmm. So there are some high dollar items that we're still holding the line on and we're reviewing each and every one of those. What about some of the cuts made to parks um, as far as like groundskeeping and have seasonal? Been seasonal was a seasonal. big piece of that. Okay. And it, that was problematic for a lot of cities because that's really kind of the area where you get the biggest bang for your buck when you need it the most, spring, summer. And Justin and I have talked about that. And those positions are returning. We just talked about that last week. So we are making those positions live. And there'll be some touch up going backwards on some of the ravines that we didn't get completely yeah. mowed and, and maintained. So we're going to go back and touch those and get caught up. Yeah, it's definitely um, emblematic of how cuts affect service provision because my complaints went through the roof, yeah. <laughs> on uh -huh. which is understandable. It's, it's, it's not a reflection of the Parks Department, but the reflection of the cut in, in staff. So yeah. appreciate that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I don't think any action is required on no. this item. So no. is there further are there comments for Angela? Mm -hmm. That's good information. Thank you. No, thank very you good. so much. Thank, thank you. you very much. OK, next item, please. Item 8, Report of City Officials. Okay, let's start with you, Nancy. Uh, nothing. Okay. What about you, John? Yeah, I have nothing this morning. Okay. So what, do you, what do you got, Steve? What I got is uh, I've known a lot of people this last couple of weeks or so that uh, have passed away. A lot of my friends uh, have an uncle who just passed away. Uh, our prayers are with the <coughs> Ojedas who have, have a lot of people that were sick. Uh, my uncle was Ray Mora, who just passed away. I was shocked to see that. Yes, mm -hmm. and uh, I just want to say our prayers are with the families, and uh, we got to keep on respecting each other, try to wear the masks. And I myself have a, a son that's sick, and I was sick, and um, we got to stay together and work together. And I like to say, on behalf of my family, the Moras, uh, God be with Ray, and and we need to pray for each other. Okay. That's all I got. Yeah. Thank you so much, Steve. I'm so sorry to hear about Ray and others in your family. Mm -hmm. Sarah, what do you have? I just had a question. Do we have any more information about um, our news question about acquisition the remainder of the property? That email came, Mayor. I'm sorry, I didn't no, mean to jump ahead, in front please. of you, but I. The recent communication that we had mm -hmm. that was consistent with the discussion with the governing body was that we would reinform them that we did have a desire to discuss the lease provisions of those other areas, but not so much the sale. Now, I know what they presented was potential purchase, 
Uh, so we have stood on our last letter indicating that we have an appetite to discuss the lease provisions, but as far as the terms of sale, we deem that to be inconsistent with the governing body. So if you wanted to do that, mm -hmm. uh, that would require well, further Yeah, discussion. I guess I was bringing it back to the council here. If we're maintaining the first half and maintaining our public access, does that affect any of your guys' opinion about selling the remaining? Because we're still getting what we want remaining the public access point. And that would allow him to leverage loans to turn the property into quite a nice venture where it would be kind of like a joint venture between the city. So if he owns the property that, so we're not giving up any of our public access, we're getting the improvements Justin wants. And then with them ha having the ability to buy the property, they can leverage more financing in order to turn it into something really great. And it could be a public private partnership and what your guys' thoughts on that would be. Does the council have any thoughts on that? Have you ever seen their business plan? I have not seen that or the articles of incorporation, I, but I've never requested it either. Yeah. It may be that staff has seen that type of information. And um, I think that's a great point and mm -hmm. it should augment and go along with what the intentions and the securing of that uh, asset would be. Didn't he put a presentation on at the Chamber of Commerce that Jade went to? How did that turn out? Yeah. I'm I think that that's something that would be helpful for the rest of council to if see. If we saw the same presentation mm -hmm. that the Hutch Chamber did? I'm not sure so. because I was sick for that meeting. But I think it's helpful. it would be helpful in determining what you want to do with that property. Um, I, on this one, um, liked what was presented by staff and and leaning toward going with their recommendation. Mm -hmm. uh, I know that we also do have a what city council policy on selling property. Um, that we would probably, we haven't really, that hasn't entered into the conversation at all, but we probably want to review on this. Um, we could reanalyze it and bring it back because it is a different request. Uh, it is a different is. request. So I'm just so. asking if you could have city staff look at that and have maybe a re-recommendation or anything. Let us do that. Okay, yeah. cool. Thank yeah. you. Let us do that. We'll bring it back and uh, I'll okay. get with Justin. We'll talk about it and, and see mm -hmm. what that might look like because it definitely okay. is a, uh, a different presentation than what it was last. Yes. Have we ever had it appraised? Not to my knowledge. Okay. Perhaps that's a step that would be helpful at this point. We'll take that into consideration for sure. Mm -hmm. Thank you, guys. Okay. Do you have other items, Sarah? No, that was it. <coughs> okay. Um, I do have a few items. I'll try to cover them quickly because I know we need to recess into executive session. First off, just wanted to um, wish everyone a very Merry Christmas. Um, we won't be able to do some of the um, things in our community that we typically do to celebrate, but I do encourage you to look at all the work that downtown Hutchinson and the Hutchinson Rec Commission is doing to provide activities for families. Um, the Hutchinson Zoo has a phenomenal light show in the mm -hmm. evenings from six to eight that you can drive by. Um, that's been really just a really great way that the staff has uh, stepped up and provided unique ways to uh, make the holiday special in this weird environment. Um, again, yeah, Hutch, Hutcherec Commission Facebook page and uh, website has several events that are family and COVID friendly. They're giving away gingerbread houses this Saturday. And mm -hmm. um, this third Thursday, they are also doing um, a fun event at six o'clock, giving away spread the love hutch kits to put a heart in your um, yard. So just a, I'm really impressed with our staff and how they have done so much this year when we were forced to require them to work on so much less. And I just think it's been an extraordinary display of uh, public service and hard work on their part even though they were undergoing the same challenges all of us were with, uh, you know, no child care or um, other restrictions. So kudos to them. I wish, wish all of them a very Merry Christmas. I uh, wanted to give a shout out to Chief, who was just named to C-Post, which is a huge honor. Um, so congratulations on your appointment to that commission. Um, 
So one other thing I wanted to touch on that I know he doesn't want me to touch on, um, Jim Seitnader is retiring. Mm -hmm. And um, he wanted to, to kind of go out with, without much mention, but it would be really hard for us to overemphasize the impact that that man has had on our community in a positive way. His passion, vision, um, and hard work ha completely transformed downtown Hutchinson. If you would have looked at our downtown 20 years ago, um, you would know that it's, it's unrecognizable from what it is today. And things that people thought were completely crazy, to be quite honest, like downtown lofts or, or any kind of residential um, living in the downtown area was something that he really pushed for and helped people understand the vision and helped to um, find ways to implement that. The Streetscape Project, Avenue A Park, the Wiley Building, he, he never gave up on some of these ideas that, um, again, just seemed like they couldn't happen. And I think that that is the uh, mark of an amazing public servant is somebody who recognizes that these wins uh, aren't made overnight, but that you know, stay true to their purpose and continue to um, fight for what they know is best for the future of the community. So we will miss him so dearly, but uh, send congratulations to him for his retirement and uh, wish him a wonderful holiday season and the best of luck. Um, other than that, I did want to uh, reiterate just one more time what city attorney mentioned in his prayer and what uh, Councilman Garza mentioned that let's not let our guard down on COVID and, and all do our part. We've lost 75 plus community members to this virus and uh, we have the power within each of us to stop that um, by just doing very small things like washing our hands, keeping our distance, not gathering in groups and wearing a mask. So I encourage everyone to continue doing that. And with that, I will pass it over to um, city manager. Thank you, Mayor. Hard act to follow. I appreciate that. Okay, strategic planning. We have had discussions with these guys. We've got four groups that were part of that selection process, as you guys know. We've got two that have come down to uh, uh, what I believe to be ideal uh, providers for that service. Mm -hmm. And I'll share with you at this particular point, that is Wichita State Public Policy and Management Center and also KU Public Management Center. All of their proposals fall well below 5,000 and it would be for a one day commitment. If you guys uh, have no objections in the uh, effort of time, I think we are comfortable making that selection. We're not violating anything by doing so at the staff level. Uh, we would bring that back to you and we would pitch dates uh, that would likely fall in January. Some of the dates could fall uh, the month after, uh, but they would still be pretty tight dates, I think. Uh, one of them has gone strictly to Zoom, and I thought that might be problematic for our group and what we want to do. And I know that we have opportunity to have safe distancing uh, in a way that we would conduct that. So uh, if you guys are okay with that, I'd proceed on it and we'll further yeah, communicate. Sounds great. Sounds fine. Great. Thank you all. <coughs> <coughs> also, you guys will see and will continue to experience uh, disruptions likely in our curbside recycling through our contractor. Those uh, phone communications are, unfortunately, there's no way for them as the contractor to know which day they're going to have sick employees, much like we do at the city. And so those communications start very early a.m. I think the last one I got from him was uh, 5, 5.15 in the morning, and I'm sending that out to Rebecca, and then she gets it out uh, uh, on social media. So that's really the best mechanism we have for letting people know that, hey, sorry, you're... Re your recycling made it to the curb, but the truck didn't. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Your other trash will be unaffected, but I think we're going to see continuation of these disruptions, and that's probably the best way for us to get that word out when we, when we receive it. Building official has been hired. His start date, I believe, is December 21, if memory serves. Izzy Rivera, uh, very accomplished, comes from the city of Amarillo. He has big city experience and small city experience and everything in between. I think he's going to be a really good fit for us. Um, I um, look forward to making the introduction to you all. I think he's going to, uh, he understands the issues and the challenges we face and uh, has a real good mindset for having a plan to go forward and understands the sensitivities. So it's going to be a very valuable asset to us. Also, I communicated with you all internally as to the 
wishes of Hutch Rec. They're wanting to reconfigure slightly the, uh, I think the agreement they have with the city that will allow Ron Sellers to stay on as ex officio. They want to do some slight realignment on that. And I don't know that we would have any objections to that, but if we do, it's something we probably ought to talk about or you could communicate with me individually and that'd be fine too. If we don't have any objections, uh, I'll coordinate that with him and let him know what to anticipate going forward. Would his ex officio status be based off of his position on the county commission? Is that what they mean by ex officio? Or? That's, that's my understanding and be, mm -hmm. of course, non-vote, non but uh, it would allow continuity of knowledge, I guess, in this particular case. Uh, that's how it was pitched by Tony. Uh, me being kind of the new guy on the block here, I didn't know what that looked like, but if that makes sense to you all, then I will relay accordingly. I don't, I don't see a problem with it. I didn't realize they had term limits on their I didn't either. Okay. commission. So <laughs> right. I was wondering so, why he was yeah. moving to ex officio. And I'll make sure I'm relaying that appropriately to you all, but I, that's the, uh, sort of the mm -hmm. discussion I remember. And um, I'll, I'll let Tony know. And if I'm wrong in the way I'm pitching this to you, he'll certainly correct me. So I'll, uh, I'll verify that. Okay. Uh, also, Anthony's uh, communication with us during public comments. I just found the uh, December uh, 7th email. And I think the bigger piece of confusion and frustration on this from the board, the commission, was that when the position first went out, it was announced as a part-time position. We all know that that's not where the position's going. It's going to full-time. We knew that. Uh, HR knows that. It's, it was just a matter of it not being inputted uh, properly in the uh, software uh, when it went out for advertisement. There still are requirements um, that Tony is going to have considerable frustration with. But I will point out, and I'll just read an excerpt from this email, the physical environmental demands are bona fide occupational qualification, BFOQs, and are needed to perform the essential functions of the job. That said, if we have a qualified candidate with a disability, as defined under ADA, we follow the EEOC's interactive process with the candidate to determine if reasonable accommodations can be made that will enable the candidate to perform all the essential functions of the job. And there's a whole world of conditions uh, that can come into play. They aren't just the ones that Anthony mentioned. Those are very specific and uh, certainly ones that in some circumstances can be accommodated for sure, but there's also quite a few others that we have to um, consider for accommodation if and when those arise. So just want to let you guys know uh, that piece of information has gone out. This excerpt was shared with the members of the HR Commission so they were aware of that and they knew that we were working on that. But I do recognize that uh, he's likely not going to be satisfied completely with, with uh, our resolution on that. But we are following guidelines and protocols for sure, no doubt about that. And thank you, Mayor. Thank you all um, for the executive session to uh, discuss the next item. Thank you. How long do you think? Oh, go ahead. When site news last day? Is it done? Friday. Friday. This Friday or this coming Friday? Friday. This okay. Friday. Okay. What, Thank how, you, Mayor. That's all I have. How long do you think we'll need? 20 minutes. You're so ambitious. <laughs> <laughs> An hour? No. <laughs> so, what do you think? 1040 ish? Council says suggestively uh, 30. Okay. 1045? <laughs> okay. Is there a motion to recess? <clears throat> Still move. Second. Second. Oh. <laughs> okay, further discussion? Same time. No? Please call the roll. Dave Lyon? Yes. Solner? Yes. Bagwell? Yes. Garza? Yes. 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 Mm. Okay, I need to take